Welcome to the panel on refit or how to perfect GI registration. My name is Francis Fay, head of the GI unit in the European Commission. Um, but before I get going on the panel, let, a little bit of housekeeping. A reminder, as um, as uh, Brian has just said in the introduction, you can put points and questions in the Q&A or on Slido. Uh, don't forget to put your name and uh, your organization. If you have uh, video access, you can put up your electronic hand and uh, we do encourage you to, to intervene. Just sorting out a little technical issue here. So the objectives of this panel is to put the spotlight onto GI procedures uh, of our registration system to check that we can deliver efficient registration at minimum cost and minimum burden for the stakeholders. I want to achieve two things in this panel. First, I'd very much like a list of topics that we need to examine uh, to improve our systems, um, as well as some concrete ideas as to what we can do. Secondly, uh, we need to uh, clarify how stakeholders can intervene and be involved in this process of simplification and burden reduction. To help us, we have two expert speakers. I'm going to come second to Bernard O'Connor, EU lawyer, university professor in Italy, uh, who you may have seen yesterday on the non-agri GIs. But first, we need to understand what is refit, what does it mean for our GI review, uh, and where do stakeholders come in. And for that, I'm delighted to introduce Alexandra Manole uh, from the Commission's Secretariat General. Uh, Alexandra works in the refit team, and uh, she has experience across many diverse Commission policies as they went through their refit process. So without any further Hesitation, Alexandra, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to present a few slides to give you some elements, an overview of what REFIT is and what it means. Okay. So, first of all, um, before we get into REFIT, maybe a bit of context. I would like to underline two things that are extremely important. First of all, this is something that the Commission has been doing for a very long time. So, for over a decade, we've been trying to find ways to simplify and, and reduce burden. It means that we've been looking not just at the areas we legislate and the kind of things we legislate, but also at how we do it. That is one thing. And the other thing is that we do consider simplification and burden reduction, we strive for it, but we do it without um, compromising on policy objectives. The idea isn't to have less policy objectives or to regulate less, but rather to ensure that whatever objectives we set ourselves, we do it at least cost for citizens and business. So a bit of background. In 2002, we launched the Better Regulation Program. This was the first step that we did in terms of improving legislation, simplifying legislation. So basically, the Better Regulation Program introduces impact assessments and stakeholder consultation. So whenever the Commission comes up with a proposal, it does so on the basis of an analysis. This is the impact assessment, where we gather information, we analyze it, we see what, are, what is the best option to reach the objectives we set for ourselves. Stakeholder consultations are the way in which we gather input from citizens and stakeholders to make sure that our process is transparent, but also that it takes into account the different experiences and different views um, uh, of the different stakeholders. In 2007, we launched the um, Administrative Burden Reduction Program, the ABR. The focus was on uh, reporting obligations from the business to the commission or to member states. So the idea was to eliminate as much as possible any burden that was unnecessary um, to streamline the process essentially. In 2012, the Commission launched the Regulatory Fitness and Performance Program, which I admit is a mouthful. So basically, REFIT. 
REFIT was launched to step up these efforts that the Commission had been uh, working on. And the aim is to ensure that EU laws deliver on their objectives in an efficient manner, so with the least costs possible. The REFIT concept has evolved over time. Initially, we looked into REFIT, so into this idea of simplification and burden reduction, only in certain policy areas, depending on the potential we thought they would have for this. But as of 2017, REFIT becomes, the REFIT approach becomes uh, systematic. So what this means in practice is, all revisions are REFIT. And what do I mean by that? I mean, when the Commission looks into amending a certain piece of legislation, it looks into, can we simplify and reduce burdens? Again, without compromising on the objectives that we've set for ourselves. So that means in practice that impact assessments, which I've mentioned earlier, accompany commission proposals, um, have a specific section that looks into um, REFIT. All evaluations have REFIT potential. So before we make proposals for new legislation, we look into what we currently have in place and we look into how that worked. Part of these evaluations are um, an analysis of efficiency. So essentially the costs and benefits of whatever legislation we're talking about or whatever intervention. So one of the things we do is we look back into the original impact assessment to see if our predictions, including in terms of refit and simplification and burden reduction, if they came true. And then we look, of course, into how the current setup, so whatever the legislation has in terms of provisions, if there is any further room to simplify, to reduce burdens. So as you can see, REFIT is analyzed and it materializes through the tools of better regulation because impact assessments, evaluations, they are tools of better regulation. Perhaps a word on consultations. We have several opportunities for stakeholders to provide their input. We have open consultations, so they are online, they're open for anyone, citizens, stakeholders, to provide their views. But we also have more targeted consultations, where we seek out stakeholders with um, specific expertise, with a spe specific experience, and we try to gather their more specialized um, feedback on certain things. And here, I would mention also the Fit for Future platform. So basically, it's an expert group that the Commission set up this year. It brings together uh, representatives of public authorities at national, regional, and local level, and uh, representatives of stakeholders from various, um, uh, representing various interests. And the mandate of the platform is really to look into where there is potential to simplify and reduce burdens in what policy area, in what provisions, and to bring this forward to the attention of the Commission in a, a, through opinions that should be substantiated, that should be based on evidence that they gather about the experience on the ground. And in terms of what the REFIT means in practice, I would maybe have one less thing to highlight that REFIT is a shared responsibility. Even if the Commission does a great analysis and puts forward um, an objective for simplification and burden reduction, this can only materialize if the European Council and the European Parliament, when they come together to legislate, confirm these. And it can only materialize if then the member states implement this and apply it the way it was intended. So this is just a visual representation of what I've been explaining. So as you can see, the things I was mentioning, the evaluation looks into REFIT. If we then decide that a change is needed, the impact assessment looks into REFIT. And when we put forward a commission proposal, it needs to explain what it proposes in terms of REFIT. All this is monitored through the REFIT scoreboard, which I will show you in a second. And the REFIT scoreboard keeps track of all the initiatives that have a REFIT objective. Because of course, we change legislation for other reasons than REFIT, but 
we can systematically consider refit and therefore it might be that we also have a refit objective. Then every year we put forward an annual burden survey which basically shows you um, illustrative examples and main outcomes from the year that just finished. So I mentioned stakeholder input. This is how we collect this input. Yeah? We have um, the Have Your Say portal, which uh, basically allows us to put in a, in a single place all the possibilities for consultation, as I mentioned, in the context of evaluations and impact assessments. And then there is Have Your Say Simplify, which, as the name suggests, is specifically there for suggestions on simplification and burden reduction. And what happens with this input is that it is processed by the Fit for Future platform, as I mentioned earlier, which is the expert group that helps the commission identify what areas could be further simplified or streamlined, for instance, in terms of digitalization. I mentioned REFIT scoreboard, which is the way that we keep track of all these initiatives. So um, this is just a screenshot. It looks better online, I promise. But this is it has a small introduction. And then all the initiatives are um, structured based on policy areas. And then if I go to agriculture, as you can see, the revision of the um, uh, geographic indications is also there. I've tried to highlight it here in yellow. I don't know if you can read that. But this is just to give you an idea of how we keep track of this. So you, you see the metro line, and it's basically what I've been saying. In terms of evaluation, we will show what we found out in terms of refit. Then in terms of the impact assessment, we will assess this, any potential for further reduction of burdens, any potential for further simplification. Then in the legal act, we will show whether the co-legislators have confirmed what we've proposed in terms of refit. And then sometimes in terms of implementation, it's interesting to see there are reports or um, there are workshops, there are events that allow us to understand whether on the ground this actually happens. This is just to show you the annual burden survey, the most recent one we've published. We're currently working on next year's. Um, so this contains, like I mentioned, the illustrative examples from a year, the main outcomes. Yeah? And then the Commission also announces the REFIT work it's going to do to really um, be transparent and allow stakeholders to know what's coming in terms of REFIT and in terms of what, where they will have the opportunities to provide their, their input. So I don't know if you can read on the screen, but the very first item in this REFIT Annex of the Commission Work Programme for 2021 um, is the revision of geographical indications. What does this mean? Hopefully by now you've understood, but I will uh, reiterate it. It means that your, the proposal that the Commission would put forward will have to have, in addition to other objectives, of course, an objective for simplification. It means that based on the findings of the evaluation that was concluded, the impact assessment will have to have a section on this and quantify to the extent possible this refit potential. And then just to give you um, some concrete examples, because this has been a bit theoretical, I understand. So just to, to give you some idea of what this means in practice. Yeah, Perhaps the most easy to grasp example of a refit initiative concerns reporting and monitoring obligations. So in the field of energy policy, and I mean EU energy policy, um, the Commission carried out an assessment to look into all these obligations that stem from various uh, pieces of legislation to identify things such as overlaps, if we ask for the same information in different contexts, for instance. So all this led to a proposal to streamline all the reporting that is done under energy policy and the estimated potential cost saving here is of 3.4 million euros, according to the impact assessment. So I think it's, it's the most easy to grasp thing when we talk of reporting obligations. But there's also other things like um, wider consumer choice. So in terms of digital sector policy, we have put forward a proposal which was um, adopted to revise the rules on satellite and cable transmissions. 
So basically, this is likely to make it easier to simplify things, to make it easier for broadcasters to show their programs in other member states than their own, and for um, retransmission operators to show, to make content available for other means than cable, so online essentially. So just a recap and to highlight once again the things that I think are the most important to keep in mind here. Considering graphic potential, it's a requirement. And as we've seen, we do it in terms of evaluations, in terms of revisions. That means it's firmly embedded in better regulation. And citizens and stakeholders can contribute. There are any number of opportunities for you to do so. So for public consultations, for targeted consultations, sometimes um, the commission carries out, organizes workshops, um, carries out case studies, there are expert group meetings, and of course, on Have Your Say Simplify, um, as I've shown you earlier. So for now, I will stop here. My microphone is on. Thank you very much indeed, Alexandra, for that fascinating, uh, fascinating account. Alexandra has underlined that the aim of refit, and she gave a very striking example at the end, is to save cost, for example, to producers and to reduce burdens and red tape. But she did underline without compromising on policy objectives. Uh, she pointed out that the GI review, our, our review, the strengthening of GIs, is prominent in the refit scoreboard for 2021. And she's also underlined that the effectiveness of refit is proportionate to the quantity and quality of stakeholder input. So this is very much part of the public outreach process in our review. Um, let me uh, follow up with one question. We have a couple of minutes in, uh, uh, in the current uh, uh, time area. Um, how, Alexandra, how does the Commission ensure that once we have the refit proposal, once we've, we've uh, identified areas of cost saving or burden reduction, that it actually has an impact on the ground? What kind of follow up is that? Yes, thank you, Francis. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? We can. <laughs> all right, thank you. Yes, so first of all, of course, the, the very important thing is that from the outset, this is um, based on evidence that the Commission carries out a sound and robust analysis so that when it puts forward its proposal, it's clear what it's putting forward also in terms of what the implication will be for, um, for the final users, for um, the citizen. So that is one thing that certainly we work hard to make sure happens. But then of course, I would remind what I've said earlier and that I think is a very important point, it's a shared responsibility. This can only really happen if it is um, confirmed by parliament and council. It can only really happen if we work together closely with the member states in terms of implementation, in terms of application. And of course, if we listen to stakeholders when they tell us this isn't happening or I don't feel it like that, or we see it differently that we gather this input and we try to, to follow up on this through our various monitoring um, uh, um, uh, <laughs> through the various monitoring initiatives that we have, uh, systems that we have. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I remember, um, I think it's very important, to, as Alexandra has said, to have a, s a robust and well justified um, information and evidence for the simplification without and not uh, impacting negatively on the policy because the proposal then goes through quite a lot of other pro, um, steps before it is adopted. So we'll need to have a, a good and solid case to get those simplifications. Michael McManus has just sent in a comment on the Q&A asking if we've got any interim plans for faster processing of GIs. Of course, we don't have to wait for a refit outcome or our review in order to process things faster and uh, we are proud that we now keep entirely within the six months deadline for completing analysis. But let me uh, at this point come over to, uh, the, uh, to the practice 
Let's turn from the theory to the practice. And we're joined by Bernard O'Connor, an authority on GIs, an EU lawyer, professor at the State University of Milan and at the Italian Università della Gastronomia, the Gastronomic University of Italy. Well, it's a hard job, Bernard, but I guess someone has to do it. He's carried out studies on GIs for the Commission, for DG Trade and others, and has helped several GI applicants. And it's in, in particularly in that role that we've invited Bernard to speak. And he's kindly agreed to share his experience with us. So Bernard, let me start by asking you about the process of GI registration. Um, as you know, more than many, uh, an applicant first applies to their national authorities, and if successful, the dossier comes to the Commission. Are we looking at complementarity or duplication? Um, thank you, Francis, for the invitation to be with you today, and thank you to the Commission for organizing this conference. Um, I think it's necessary, and I think it's, uh, it augurs well for the work that you guys have to do over the next year in, um, in strengthening GIs. Um, in answer to your question, um, I think the two-step approach is essential, and why? because um, geographical indications are inherently local and you need the local procedures, the local instruments of decision making to be able to resolve many of the issues that arise in the definition of the specifications. Um, you have issues in relation to um, the geographical area, you have issues in relation to for example, uh, the mix of milk in products. And I think that only these things can be resolved locally and the commission should not be involved in doing that. Um, however, the commission should be involved in, um, in, in the overall um, coherence of the um, uh, GI system. And therefore, the two-step approach is appropriate. You have a, a local step and then you have a, a, a union-wide step. So I think I like this system. It is lengthy, but it is appropriate. Um, in relation to amendments to the specifications here, I think we should only really look at a single step approach. Um, many of the local issues will have been resolved. There will be a um, in place a, a, a producer group or a consortio which will um, you know, be able to liaise uh, and, and coordinate the efforts of local producers. Um, but I think the, there should be a one-step approach which should be at the commission level because it should be, or the union level, because it should be at the union level for reasons of rigor and consistency. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. You're underlining the, the local approach for dealing with the local issues um, and, uh, and preserving that, but also a need for consistency. Uh, still on consistency, we have four G GI systems after yesterday, maybe a fifth will be coming. Uh, the current systems are food, wines, spirits and aromatized wines. How much in your experience is consistency an issue? Um, yeah, I think there are two points here. Um, one is the effective consistency within the Commission services in reviewing particular applications, depending on whether it's a food or it's a spirit. Um, the other is more legislative consistency um, and legal consistency. Now, um, the TRIPS agreement says that we must provide uh, protection for goods. It does not give us any um, justification or reason to distinguish between goods, whether it is distinguishing between agri and non-agri, or whether it is distinguishing within agri as between spirits and foodstuffs and, uh, uh, and wines. So I think we need a single instrument. Um, I think it's better for everyone uh, to understand more clearly. Now, there has been some um, <clears throat> there has been some movement towards uh, a consistency between the existing four instruments, but I think it needs to go further. 
Um, we were able to make a common organization of the market for 23 different products, everything from the to milk. So um, I don't see why we shouldn't be able to make a, um, uh, you know, everything from cheese to Connemara marble. Um, I think it's not without, uh, it's not, it can be easily done. And as I say, I think the TRIPS agreement guides us in that direction as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, a single, a single instrument. Um, I'm assuming you're talking a single instrument for the, the processing, the, the time schedule, the um, standard of examination, rather than for the specific rules of the wines and spirits, or also you think we should have simply uh, one system? No, I think overall we should have one system, including the wine, including the substantive and the procedural criteria for the different things. As I say, if we can, you know, the difference between milk and sugar or milk and bananas or milk and fruit and vegetables within the common market organization are quite substantive um, in terms of the details needed for a particular um, uh, uh, regime. But we have been able to make them into a single uh, instrument. And I think we should do it for geographical indications, both for okay. domestic consistency and international consistency. Okay, good point. Um, let me turn to the quality of the applications and the uh, assessments process. It's quite common, you'll be aware of this, it's quite common for applicants to be asked, uh, both in the national assessment uh, and by the Commission uh, for more information to complete their dossier, to better justify uh, claims made in the dossier, or simply to make the presentation more fit for the publication in the official journal. Um, well, how do you think we can, we can uh, get applicants to get it right the first time? Is there some communication issues here? Um, yeah, this, this backwards and forwards is always frustrating for the applicant. And, um, and I can imagine it's also frustrating for um, commission examiners um, because uh, you would want to have a coherence in, in all of this. I think um, I, I have two ideas that um, uh, would help on this. I think um, the commission maybe should think about having certain types of templates um, certain types of, um, um, you know, guidelines, if you like, as to how to um, uh, better make an application. Um, now, and I think there is an element of internal coherence. I think there is improvement in the last couple of years, but I think there is quite a lot of difference between different examiners in relation to different um, um, applications. Now, uh, I think there is a, there, there's a kind of a way of doing things if it's a spirits application, there's a kind of a way of doing things if it's a foodstuff application, and it might be good to try and um, make those things more co coherent. Um, I will give you an example. In, in one recent application, um, I've been asked to remove issues in relation to packaging in the country of origin. And in another application, I've been asked to include it. So, I mean, this, this, this makes my job rather difficult because when I'm putting my first draft together, I simply don't know what to include and what not to include. Okay, well, uh, certainly, certainly the point is, uh, is well made on uh, providing better guidance for applicants. On the packaging rules, uh, we sometimes see a confusion between uh, just information as to how the producer will package the product and what we're really after, which is whether or not they want the packaging and bottling requirement to be enforced in the single market. And that raises as you as a competition lawyer will understand a lot of issues. So that's why sometimes they're in, sometimes they're out. We could have an entire panel on packaging and bottling, but uh, that'll be for the next conference. Let's turn to efficiency in uh, dossier assessment and uh, in oppositions. And uh, I'm gonna ask you if you see room for improvements there. Um, I want to, but also remind us of Alexandra's point that increasing efficiency um, and 
processing things faster cannot be at the expense of the quality of, of the assessment or as you have just pointed out, the consistency of the assessment. So where can you see room for improvements in efficiency? Um, well, I have noticed that there must be, there, 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 there has been um, um, increased efficiency because in the past uh, we have waited quite often a, a, um, a year for a first response, if you like, rather than the official acknowledgement of an application, but a year for the first substantive response. And I think now, um, more recently, I see that is down to uh, about six months. So I think that is something that is, is great. It would be fantastic if it was less than six months. But presumably that means more resources and we're all fighting for resources. So whether you'll be able to get them or not, I don't know. But um, six months, it seems to me, is a max. Um, I don't think you should um, uh, go over six months and if you could get it down to maybe three or four, it would be great. In relation to the opposition procedure, we have a situation where you've got three months after the publication of the single document to register an opposition, and then you've a further two months in which to lodge your re reason statement in opposition. Now, that's a five month period. And I, I really don't see very much justification for five months. Um, if, if I, as a lawyer, wish to challenge an act of one of the institutions, the law provides that I have two months and 10 days in which to lodge my application. And um, my application must be to the court must be, uh, must be complete. If I leave something out, that then um, um, means I, uh, or at least if I leave a basic plea in law out, I can't reintroduce it later. So it's quite a strict procedure. I don't see why it couldn't work in relation to this. Um, that being said, I think the facility to extend the period of opposition is important because sometimes you can have difficult dossiers and sometimes you do need, you know, level-headed, you know, mature um, discussions um, of how to resolve certain of these issues and time limits don't really facilitate good negotiation in, in that system. Um, the third thing that I find is odd is that the Commission still has a system whereby it is the gatekeeper for the reason, sa reason statement in opposition. Um, the Commission will evaluate the admissibility of the reason statement before passing it on to the applicant. Um, and I really don't see very much reason for this. Um, in fact, I think it's something that the Commission should not really be involved in because it's only another act that can be challenged and takes time. Okay, uh, good points. And uh, we're, we're con conscious of the inconsistencies uh, between the schemes of the uh, time delays there. Let me turn to uh, one of the potential solutions, potential solutions, and that is digital transformation. Uh, we already have e-filing for some of the uh, applications, obligatory and spirits and wines, but uh, uh, still optional and not used that much in food uh, and online tools in general. Uh, so when there's e-filing, it puts the whole thing in our e-ambrosia system right the way through to the public announcement of the registration or, um, or of the publication with, with the links uh, and so on. Um, so, Looking at e-filing and uh, practice on, in the potential of using online tools, what, what can we do there, Bernard? What, what do you see as being uh, the opportunities that we should be looking at? Um, I look at this from a very pragmatic point of view, and I think that there are two big themes in my thoughts. The first is, um, when an application goes in, and there is an exchange with the Commission as to the, um, um, as to the corrections or, or, or requirements or, or whatever, leading up to the single document. Um, I'm not so sure whether that should be too transparent. In other words, online available to everybody. Because I think both the applicant and the competent authority, the Commission, the examiner, need to feel a certain 
flexibility and a certain um, privacy in, 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 in having the exchanges that are necessary to get a, an application in shape for publication as a single document. However, once a single document goes out, I think there you need to have a, a, a kind of an online system which allows the parties to um, um, submit their papers. Now, um, I'm not so sure whether this online system should be open to all of the public, but rather be open to parties who express an interest. In other words, the applicant and the opponent um, and maybe the opponent's government, okay. um, these sorts of things, uh, they should be a restricted set of openness, if you like. But I think we can have a better platform. Okay, there, and there are actually a lot of examples of that, uh, where the, the, the applicants and the opponents or the parties uh, have access to certain parts of the dossier, uh, and, um, and, and then eventually the general public, I think, can see most of the dossier. Last point I'd like to cover with you, Bernard, is uh, on enforcement. Um, the, once the GI is registered, we look to the national authorities to enforce it. They are under pressure, uh, particularly in, uh, in, in, the, in the field of enforcement, uh, to focus on food safety. But so what are your thoughts on this area? Where, where can we see uh, economies and deficiencies being made there? Um, yeah, this comes back to resources and the member states don't have um, uh, the resources. And the more and more registrations we have, the, the more spread out or thinned thinned out uh, the, uh, the, uh, the resources are. Um, I think my instinct is that in relation to the um, controls on production, um, we do not see a great amount of trouble in that area. Yes, I think um, we need to look at um, whether we have um, uh, we allow producer groups to control themselves um, with the appropriate Chinese walls, with the appropriate um, um, competition law, um, you know, safeguards and whatever. Um, but I, I think we can make that more efficient by giving more control to the producers themselves. But on the wider sense, I do not see fraud and uh, counterfeiting being such a major problem at the production a a a stage. It's more the enforcement in the marketplace where we have a problem. Um, now, where we have limited resources, um, certainly limited public resources, then the question is, do we give a greater role to the consortia, to the producer groups? And I think in other words, privatize the, the, uh, the, 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 privatize the enforcement um, in the marketplace. And here, I think we should do a lot more to um, privatize it, not taking away the ex officio controls. The ex officio controls for me are not only important for small and medium size or, or, or whatever, but they're also very important as to the nature of GIs. GIs are a public um, resource. And so therefore, um, just to show the necessity or the, the link between that public element, that public collectivity, um, for that very reason alone, we should keep the ex officio controls in place, but give greater, um, give greater capacity to the producer groups or the consortia to, 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 to enforce their rights. Okay, very good point, Bernard. And indeed, the subject of another panel is the empowerment of producer groups. And of course, they need to be given the tools and maybe also the resources, for instance, through rural development, if we're going to ask them to do that. Just half a minute, any final comment, Bernard, from you? Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, um, as I say, the, 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 for me, the overall coherence of the system is very important. And um, there, the, the European Union um, policy choice of wanting to protect GIs and, 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 and seeing the value of GIs as an intellectual property, for me means that we need to have this coherence in our domestic legislation 
um, so that it gives us a greater um, um, strength in our international relations. Okay, excellent. And thank you very much indeed, Bernard O'Connor, for thoughtful observations and thought-provoking suggestions. Um, and uh, we've got much to chew on there. Um, now, I'm going to open for public debate. I see a small forest of hands have gone up. Um, I'll just, the ones I've noted that I'll take are, uh, if we have time, so I will appeal to in, uh, people intervening to keep it sweet and short. Uh, Martin Ekvad, Anna Soero, uh, Gabriela Falouche, Benjamin Fontaine, Thomas Lividin, I hope I got that right, and Liam McHale. So I'll take, uh, I'll hope to, that we can take those six and uh, come, if I may, to Martin Egfad. Very pleased to see your hand go up, Martin. Martin is the president of CPVO, uh, the community or the union plant varieties office, uh, which also operates an IP register. So they're sort of cousins in terms of the public administration to, to the GIs. Um, so Martin, uh, what steps or measures does CPVO take to maintain efficiency and effectiveness? What, what can we steal from you, Martin? Well, uh, good morning, Francis. Good morning, everyone. And uh, um, I would like to congratulate you to organizing this very important seminar, improving the IP system from GIs. Um, what can you steal of us? I think nothing. We, we would be happy to give away anything that we can share. So <clears throat> I, I know you're discussing GIs, but I can share perhaps some of the things that we do at the CPVO. Uh, at the CPVO, we do a, a formal and substantive examination. Um, and there we have legal deadlines and internal deadlines um, and uh, deadlines for, for parties to proceedings, which are rather tight. Uh, <clears throat> but that doesn't... I think that's not different from, from any other in institution in this respect. What is perhaps interesting for you to know is that the technical examination that is done when we assess a new plant variety is done by examination offices in the member states. And we have more or less 30 examination offices in the member states. And when we get an application, we ask them to do a test. Uh, in order for them to be able to do the test, they have to be um, comply with quality requirements. Um, and they, those quality requirements are adopted by our managing board. And uh, the good thing about this is that if an application is filed on a national level first, and then on an EU level, the CPO can take over that report. So we don't have to do two tests. So it's not a two tier system. Uh, because we rely on the examination officer's quality because they have, um, uh, have to comply with this, those requirements, um, we, can, we don't do, have to do it twice. So I think that that is one very important element. Uh, another is that we have a very flat decision-making process. We are a small agency. We have uh, technical experts who deal with the files and they propose uh, to a committee uh, uh, decision after having reviewed the results of the technical examination. Uh, so it's two, two steps and then we have a decision which is applicable throughout the European Union throughout the 27, 28 well, uh, member states. Uh, so I think that is very, very transparent, very uh, uh, simplified procedure. Uh, for transparency, we have, as it was explained also by Mr. O'Connor, we have uh, objections, procedures, so anyone can make an objection. They will have access to all the documents in the file. Um, you could yeah. then, from, from, having make, uh, well, from the date that we take a decision, uh, appeals can be made by our Board of Appeal. And from the Board of Appeal, uh, appeals can be made to the Court of Justice. So there is a full transparency and a procedure to ensure that our, our decisions are taken 
uh, in a uh, transparent manner. Uh, and perhaps lastly, good news for the, those responsible for the EU budget, because we are self-financed, so the industry pays for, for everything. Uh, they pay fees, and, but they are also in observers into our administrative council, so they, they are scrutinizing our fees very carefully. So, well, those are some uh, issues regarding the, our system that perhaps you want to reflect on, and I would be happy to share more details on that with you and others in, in the debate. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed, Martin, uh, and, and thank you for your openness on uh, the systems that you're operating. I think I'm sure that there's things that uh, we, can, we can share. Um, I was looking also at the, what's coming through on the Q&A, um, and there's a, uh, sometimes it's not entirely clear who is asking. It, yeah, the point was made, and Martin referred to that a little bit, that there's um, offices dealing with GIs all across the union. In some countries, you may have it on a regional basis. So you've probably got, uh, they estimate 250 offices uh, dealing with GIs. And they, uh, the, the questioner is saying, does that make sense from an outside view? Should it all be concentrated? Um, uh, let me come again to a speaker from the floor, Ana Soero who is uh, Vice President Origin Europe and uh, Chief of Origin Portugal. So, Anna, you want a faster system? Uh, good morning, Fred. Good morning, everybody. everybody. Uh, yes, I have nothing against in the, in, the, in the principal point of view. I have nothing against, but on practical issues, I think that uh, uh, the system must remain European. And if you spread everything to the member states, you will have a member state system. So we will, could have 25 or 26 or 27 systems going together. And this is very dangerous. So I think that uh, we can make it easy, but the Commission must provide uh, authorities with guidelines and with um, those templates in order to facilitate things, must allow that everybody make comments, not only the other people from other member states and the, the ones from the, the member states dealing with the application should be allowed also to do uh, comments. And something that I think it is important to is to, to be mandatory that in member states, near the authorities, they have uh, experts, uh, a group of experts, independent experts that could make a good analysis of each application. Okay. Considering the, the, the only one law for the four products or five products, I have nothing against. So I think uh, we can merge in the same regulation for every thing, being uh, food or not food uh, products. Uh, only one concern, what about TSGs? Because TSGs are very important also, and they should not be uh, forgotten. Uh, yeah. I know that they are not intellectual property, so perhaps they should be uh, separate, but remaining, please. Thank you. Ind indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for your, your observations and the idea of having an, uh, a centre d'excellence in each member state. I think that's a, a one that might catch. Uh, on TSG, so that's not what we're discussing in this conference, there's also a question from Veronica Garcia Chiquero. Uh, what is the place of TSGs? I would direct you to the in the roadmap, which is published on the site uh, that um, that uh, uh, Alexandra referred to earlier, um, the roadmap uh, which contains our, uh, our provisional ideas of how to make TSGs work. We're a bit disappointed in the scheme, only 60 registrations in 10 years, and we, want, we think Europe's traditions deserve better. So we are looking for ideas on a, on a better solution. Let me come, uh, I would like our three 
uh, four outstanding speakers. I see we still, we're still okay for time, but I would uh, urge you to make your points uh, um, economically. G Gabriela Falouche, uh, and I believe you're from the Hungarian ministry, and I'm, if so, I'm delighted because we have had a certain reticence from national bodies to, uh, to uh, um, uh, support this particular panel. But Gabriela, uh, what's, what's it like from your perspective? Hello, good morning, everybody. It's an honor for me to participate in this conference, and I also congratulate you to organize uh, this conference. And uh, yes, uh, Hungary in the last uh, uh, five years uh, forwarded uh, uh, 76 applications to the Commission for a uh, community, and uh, we had a lot of experience uh, uh, on this issue. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, first of all, I, I'm shared the opinion that to gain the best result from refit uh, process, the national authorities and the stakeholders must play a full part in this process. Um, to my mind, the new legislation system can rely on the uh, member states' uh, stakeholders' experience and uh, view uh, on how the legislation system can be improved. And, uh, According to the existing GI legislation, uh, when we read in parallel the legislation of the fourth uh, sector, sector, we can find the same corner stores uh, and the same aims. Uh, but uh, we have to face that the definition and the phrases and the translations uh, differ. So it, it causes difficulties, uh, not only for the applicants, <laughs> but sometimes it also also the member states authority how to understand uh, and uh, what is the requirements. Uh, of, of course, the uh, these guidelines uh, that you prepared, uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, it's very good and to help uh, everybody. Uh, but uh, at not least, uh, we must not forget uh, that uh, GI is uh, not only an uh, IP right, but uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, they are products for consumption. So they are produced by people who live in a rural area. So the GIs are also a development uh, issue as well. And um, I'm, uh, uh, I like very much this uh, GI view. <laughs> I think it's a very uh, attractive and uh, uh, you can find a lot of information uh, uh, and you can see the products. But now I'm a little bit confused, which is the official uh, database, uh, Ambrosia or uh, okay. <laughs> this, uh, <Yeah>. GI view. <laughs> well, th thank you, Gabriella, for your, for your observations and, and for re referencing those guidelines. It, it's, it's, we're still at the early stages of uh, harmonized guidelines, but uh, we, we obviously need to go in that direction. I'm hearing that from several speakers. Um, the, reg the official register, the legal register remains and will always remain E. Ambrosia. So if uh, Bernard O'Connor is taking us to court and he needs to prove uh, the dates of a, of a regulation or the status of an application, it's E. Ambrosia where he'll take his download and that would be the official data on registration. Um, GI View is taking that data and obviously not changing it at all. And so it, it's re-broadcasting it uh, on GI View, but also allowing uh, producer groups to add the information that we saw yesterday. And um, that's something that they can't do into eAmbrosia, which is closed, a closed system for security reasons between the commission and member states. And, uh, and so that engagement of producer groups and um, uh, and involvement is one of the big differences. But the legal register remains GI um, e Ambrosia. Let me come uh, with just and plead for just uh, a minute or two from the, the next speakers, Benjamin Fontaine of um, the EC Trademark Association. Hi, thank you, Francis. Good morning, everybody from the trademark. Uh, practitioner, a better lover of GIs. I just wanted to say that uh, at ECTA, we support um, the improvement of the efficiency, quality, 
and transparency. And in this respect, I think the experience of the trademark practitioners and of the EU IPO here in Alicante is very interesting. Uh, I, I would like to support what was said by Bernard uh, in his interventions, uh, mostly. I would add the extra layer that we believe that having access to the whole files as we do have in the trademark system is only positive. It brings a lot of transparency. And uh, in this respect, we also support uh, the idea of uh, having the commission taking real quality decisions. Why not having real opposition decisions in the GI examination when there are oppositions? Why not having a substantive examination of the commission also, which would be public uh, when reviewing GI applications? The way we do in trademarks, I think, can be adopted also in this field of GIs for better quality and a better uh, transparency. Uh, that's, that was all, thank you. Excellent, thank you. And thank you for uh, picking up on, uh, on the points made earlier by, uh, by Bernard O'Connor. And um, I'm sure we'll be looking at transparency as we go forward. Uh, Thomas Lividin, uh, if we've got contact with you, uh, one minute, please. Yes, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And yes, could you introduce you yourself? Yes, I'm Thomas Lividini and I am the Brussels representative of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. I'll be very quick. I'll uh, uh, cut most of my speaking points. But um, uh, you just want to say that the U.S. Tech, um, uh, welcomes the ongoing evaluation because we believe it's uh, actually an opportunity to critically reflect on how to create a fairer system, which recognizes the, all the legitimate uh, uh, aspirations and rights of GI holders, trademark holders, and also uh, producers of common food names. By the way, this uh, principle was also brought up by Professor Ganji uh, in his opening remarks yesterday. So with regards to, I've got two points with regards to the evaluation. Um, well, obviously I, um, I agree with, uh, with the point raised by the previous speaker. Um, we are concerned that uh, in the cap reform, the commission has proposed to shorten the time frame for, for preparing oppositions. Um, and this was actually also shared yesterday by uh, Mr. Futscher the, of the German presidency. But the most important thing, I think, is the continued absence of, uh, of clarity with regards to generic names. The original legislation provided for uh, uh, the drawing up of a, a list of generic names and the current legislation also uh, provides the, um, that the Commission should lay down rules to uh, clarify to the generic status of terms. I think this is a very important uh, issue that would certainly bridge the gaps, I mean, at least would help bridge the gaps between our different, uh, different positions. Um, uh, the private sector is already looking at ways to cooperate. For instance, I'd, I'd like to recall the memorandum of understanding between the consortium of, of, of uh, mozzarella, di bufala, campana, and Uestic, which uh, unequiv unequivocally uh, establishes the uniqueness of the Italian GI and the genericness instead of the term mozzarella. I would like to know what you think about this and uh, hope that you will consider these issues okay. because in the impact assessment, I didn't see them, uh, I didn't see them uh, raised. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levidini. And, um, and, and thank you for those uh, comments. We, we will take into account all, all uh, um, such submissions. Um, 30 seconds from Liam McHale, then I'll come back to Bernard and Alexandra for last comments. Uh, Liam McHale. who's not perhaps online, in which case, Bernard, um, le let me give uh, uh, the last word to, to you and to Alexandra. If you could have two improvements of the huge list that you've just presented us with, which would they be? Uh, with your mic, mic, mic on Bernard. Sorry, I suppose uh, better guidelines from you would be would be useful and um, and if we're talking about um, uh, pools of expertise at the member state level, I think maybe we should talk about pools of expertise at the Brussels level. Um, I think that the whole application process goes better the more professional the players are on both sides. I mean, in the applicants. So thank I would you. call for something on that line. Excellent. Thank you, Bernard. And the last word to Alexandra. From what you've heard from the interventions from the floor, from uh, the, the debate on the chat, is this the kind of questions that you uh, like to see in a refit process?
Yes, thank you, Francis. Um, so I, I've heard a lot of interesting points and I see that your uh, stakeholders are very involved and they have a lot of concerns and I think this just highlights the importance of, of having them uh, with you in the process and gathering their views and using it as part of your analysis, of course. Of course, not everything is strictly speaking about REFIT, but when you change your legislation, you want to, from a more broad, broader yeah. point of view, you want to improve it overall. So I think certainly... This, uh, this sounds promising, but it's rather complex. Thank you. So. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, time is against us. Um, I thank uh, Alexandra and Bernard, my excellent speakers, and the contributors from the floor. Uh, this has been an extremely important panel, and I know that uh, in my unit, we will be pawing over it as we continue the impact assessment and refit process. We now return to plenary setting for the coffee break. Brian Maguire will be catching up with the other moderators uh, to see how those panels went. And with that, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>